so in line with what uh, Chet and Steve were said this morning about how maps can inspire texts and how the intermingling of literature and cartography has brought us all today to talk about these connections, my presentation today aims to study the adaptation of geographical knowledge and cartographic images of the North Polar region in La Vie, Les Aventures et Les Voyages de Groenland du Reverend Père Cordelier Pierre de Messange. I won't repeat the title too often because it's quite long. Uh, but this is in this imaginary travel account written by Simon Tissot de Patot and published anonymously in Amsterdam in 1720, its protagonist discovers an underground society in the furthermost limits of the Northern Hemisphere. I am particularly interested in examining how and why a specific set of cartographic images of the Northern Hemisphere was appropriated, adapted, and introduced in the fictional world proposed by Simon Tissot de Patot. In order to understand the dynamic relationship between cartographic images and literary representations in this boreal utopia, in the first part of this presentation, I would like to examine the scope and limits of Gerard Genet's concept of hypertextuality in relation to the possible influence of early modern maps and geographical works in Tissot's novel. I will then address the reality effects used by Tissot de Patot to anchor his imaginary travel account to a specific spatial and temporal reality. And special attention will be paid to the power of ekphrasis, that is the translation of visual images into textual representations and its importance in early modern travel accounts, as well as in cartographic fiction. Last but not least, and if time is on my side, my presentation will end with a very brief overview of the many ways in which early modern cartographic knowledge was appropriated and circulated beyond academic or scholarly context. In Palimpsests, Gerard Jeannette analyzes five types of transtextuality or ways in which texts form relationships with other texts. I would briefly like to focus on the fourth type, which he calls hypertextuality. In terms of the French critic and theorist, hypertextuality is any relationship uniting a text B, which he calls hypertext, to an earlier text A, which he calls hypotext. In other words, hypertextuality refers to a text derived from another pre-existent text. The idea that a text is unable to exist without a previous text from which it originates, invites us to reflect on the relationship between pre-existing images, such as verbal or graphic representations and texts. If cartographic images, such as maps and geographical knowledge can inspire fictional travel accounts, then the question is what texts and maps acted as Tissot de Patot's hypotext? What is the relationship between literature and cartography when there is no actual fictional or non-fictional map included in a literary text, which is the case of the Voyage de Groenland of Tissot de Patot. Uh, the only existing individual edition of La Vie, Les Aventures et Le Voyage de Groenland uh, was published by Etienne Roger in two duodecimo, that's my hand, so to see the more or less the size of it, in two duodecimo volumes in Amsterdam in 1720 and did not contain any maps. In fact, it only included one engraving that pictured the first encounter of Pierre de Messange and five other survivors of this supposed shipwreck with the inhabitants of Greenland, who dressed in skins and armed with bows and arrows would soon after lead him to this underground utopian kingdom of Rufsal. The inclusion of maps in travel accounts, universal histories, cosmographies, and other works of this kind was not evident as economic and technical difficulties generally prevailed. But for this and other, I think more important and specific reasons that I will delve into later on, with the exception of the fold-out fictional map included in the Histoire du Grand the Admirable Royaume d'Antangil, which we talked about yesterday in our visit to the Getty Museum, uh, none of the imaginary travel accounts published in French throughout the 17th and early 18th centuries included cartographic images. In fact, 
Tissot's first imaginary travel accounts, The Voyage and Aventure of Jacques Massé, published between 1714 and 1715, did not contain any maps either. As he had done when writing the adventures of Jacques Massé, in La Ville, Les Aventures et Les Voyages de Groenland, Tissot de Patot resorted to the existing visual and narrative representations of the polar regions so as to create a plausible but elusive setting to the misadventures of Pierre de Messange. Given the controversial context of the book in terms of religion, which I will not go into, to protect himself from possible censorship in the epistle, Tissot explained he had done nothing more than edit and publish a manuscript containing the travels and discoveries around the boreal pole of Pierre de Messange. As a result of his misadventures in France and the United Provinces, this Pierre de Messange, fictional character, while tra traveling aboard a German whaler, had shipwrecked off the northern shores of Greenland, 12 degrees close to the North Pole, where he had found a perfectly organized underground society. The choice of Greenland for the novel setting was based on the narrative possibilities offered by the marginal condition of a still unexplored territory. Throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, the proximities of the North Pole had been the depository of the most varied theories inherited from classical antiquity, as well as an object of speculation among early modern travelers. The expectations regarding the possible existence of an interoceanic Northwest or Northeast passage that would allow commerce with the Far East coexisted with the remnants of the ancient beliefs in the Hyperboreans or the debate on the habitability or inhabitability of the frigid zone. The geographical knowledge of these boreal territories was probably endorsed by the information provided by Isaac de la Peyrère in his Relation de Groenland, but also by Louis Morelli and Pierre Bale's dictionaries, or by journals such as the Journal des Savants or the Dutch version, right, the Nouvelle de la République des Lettres. Even though Tissot de Patot does not mention his sources explicitly, the main source of information about Greenland in Europe at the time was Isaac de la Peyrère's Relation de Groenland. In 1644, the French philosopher, and many other things, I mean, had traveled to Denmark for diplomatic reasons, and during his time there, he had been in contact with the Danish scholar and humanist Ole Wern, who was in charge of providing all the sources and contacts Lapidaire needed in order to write his Relation d'Islande and his Relation de Groenland, which he published anonymously in Paris in 1647. The fold out map it contained its small size and the fact that it was affordable and presented information that had never been published in French before made the book very popular. Apart from its many editions and translations, it was translated into German, Dutch, English, Danish. The French version of the Relation de Groenland was also included in the first volume of the Recueil de Voyage au Nord, a compilation of Northern voyages published in Amsterdam in many volumes in 1715. But the Relation de Groenland is in the first volume of this compilation, right? Five years before Tissot published his Boreal Utopia. There are fragments from the Relation de Groenland that Tissot de Patot seems to have copied almost literally or with very slight alterations. While La Perrière says that the oaks are so vigorous and strong, that they bear acorns as big as apples, describing Greenland, Tissot de Patot explains that the trees are like oaks with acorns that are the size of a hen's egg, similar to an apple, and tender and pleasant uh, to taste. In addition to this, there are many other examples, but I will not stop in each of them, but in addition to describing Greenland as a fertile territory, despite being in the vicinity of the North Pole, La Perere had also highlighted the abundance of precious minerals and other treasures. All of these elements became part of the literary landscape depicted by Tissot throughout the novel. The presence of Greenland, Greenland in the book's title, Tissot's acquaintance with La Perere's uh, controversial propositions in other of his texts, I'm thinking specifically of the Prea Damitae, uh, and the repetition of descriptive elements present in the Relation de Groenland indicate it was probably the main hypotext, thinking of Jeanette's uh, classification, of Tissot's boreal utopia. But what about the fold-out map, which you saw in the previous slides, 
uh, that Lapeyrere published together with his history of Greenland. Was it a source of information or inspiration for Dissot de Patot? What maps, if ever, did he resort to in order to enhance the reality effects of his writing? Now we go to the second part of this. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, La Vie, Les Aventures et Les Voyages de Groenland did not contain any fictional nor non-fictional maps. It did, however, mention specific place names and describe landscapes in detail. The verbal representation of graphic representation or ekphrasis was, in fact, a trait of early modern travel accounts. In the context of European overseas expansion, the use of maps of any uh, or any other kind of visual representation, engravings, drawings, etc., was one of the ways, but not the only one, to translate specific on the ground experience to readers. In his recent study of maps and fiction in the early modern age, Chartier, Roger Chartier has stated that words can be enough to reproduce mental geographies that do not require engravings or maps. The trust in the power of ekphrasis has been, without any doubt, one of the reasons behind the absence of maps in certain genres. This is what Chartier said. Tissot de Patot did not need to include, if we follow this argument, right, to include any maps as long as the descriptions or verbal representations of space he made of the North Polar region were detailed, evocative, or authentic enough. In the early 18th century, now I'm going to see, I mean, what maps could have possibly inspired some episodes that appear in the novel. In the early 18th century, the many English and Dutch attempts to find the Northeast or Northwest Passage had resulted in the production of several cartographic images. Tissot's description of Greenland and the North Pole seemed to have originated in two of these images, or the many versions of these two maps I'm going to talk about. Tissot's description of Greenland and the North Pole then, I mean, neither, sorry, neither of these images uh, were directly connected to La Peyre's map. In fact, there are no conclusive elements to determine the influence of La Perere's map on Tissot's novel. The place names mentioned in Tissot's imaginary travel account are not present in La Perere's map or in the maps that La Perere says he consulted before presenting this map of Greenland. The analysis of two ekphrastic episodes present in La Ville des Aventures et les Voyages de Groenland of Tissot reveal that the maps that Tissot de Patot most probably had in mind or within his reach when writing his Boreal Utopia were the 1598 map of the polar regions by William Barents and Gerardus Mercator's 1595 Septentrionalum Terrarum Descriptio, or one of its many copies or imitations. The two ekphrastic episodes I'm referring to are the arrival of Pierre de Messange to Greenland and his expedition in, the search, in search of a fantastic city in the proximities of the North Pole, which takes place towards the end of the first volume. In the first case, his ar arrival to Greenland, Pierre de Messange uh, describes his arrival as follows. Finally, having reached the height of 70 degrees, a terrible storm attacked us, and separated us from several buildings, which until then we had not yet lost sight of. The bad weather carried us as far as between Groenland and New Newtland, about 12 degrees from the pole, and within sight of certain lands, which our sailors said they had as boundaries Schul and Fokkelshoek. The latitudes, the place names, Groenland, Newtland, and Fokkelshoek, and the fact that the ship is driven by a storm between Greenland and Newtland coincide with William Barron's map of the polar regions drawn from his observations during his third voyage of 1596-1597. This map was made out of the original charts designed uh, by Barron's in his third, third and last attempt, and I mean, he dies in this third voyage, to find the Northeast Passage that would allow Dutch commerce with the Far East. The map was drawn by Cornelis Kleitz and engraved by Battista van Dertum in 1598. It was published as a separately issued map and several surviving copies can be found in composite atlas of the period. So it circulated individually. And Behrens, 
was the first to depict the western contours of the island of that was later going to be known as Spitsbergen, which he discovered in 1596 and named the new land of Het Nieuwe Land in Dutch, right there to the left. It is drawn center left of the map and 12 degrees south of the North Polar Circle. The presence of Het Nieuwe Land and Fergal's Hawk, which is also there, in Barron's map and not in Lapidaire's or Tellius's or any other map of the Arctic region, speaks of Barron's possible influence on Tissot's verbal representation of that specific area of the globe. In the second ekphrastic description or episode in the novel, the influence of Gerardus Mercator's cartographic projection and his map of the North Pole prevail. At least this is the hypothesis I'm presenting today and probably like to discuss with you. Uh, before the first volume ends, Pierre de Messange joins an expedition in search of a fantastic city, not the fantastic city he was in, but another fantastic city in the proximities of the North Pole. Let's do the English version. Um, at 90 degrees North latitude, he finds a small stream which he easily crosses by foot. And he says, try to sort of listen to the description and look at the map at the same time. The map, of course, is not Tissot's, it's Mercator's. Having le then left the precipice on the right, we came to a small stream which we could easily cross. We skirted it and were surprised after, traveled, um, after having traveled a league of way to find a round pond, which was about three or 400 paces in diameter and from which issued three other streams similar to the preceding one at the same distance from each other of the same width and flowing towards opposite sides. So that if they had been prolonged by one side, they would have cut each other in right angles. And on the other, they would have divided the sphere into four equal parts. This observation, says Missange, made me judge that this pond was necessarily located at the boreal pole of the earth, not only because the water descended from it all around, but also mainly because there was a continuing bubbling which could not possibly be caused except by the agitation of subtle matter, which must necessarily enter and leave through the two extremities of the world. The vivid description of the North Pole divided into four equal parts separated by rivers flowing in opposite directions can only refer to Mercator's polar projection of the earth and map, which Dussault puts into words with remarkable efficacy. Mercator's Septentrionalum Terrarum Descriptio was published in uh, 19, uh, 1595, sorry, and is considered the first individual map devoted to the Arctic regions. Chet has written a very interesting article, but I mean, I won't go into detail with this, but the map was drawn on the most reliable sources available at the, what were considered the most reliable sources available at the time, which dated back to the 14th century and before. In it, the North Pole is represented by a black mountain that is surrounded by four rings, ring-shaped land masses on, or islands of equal size. Each island is separated from each other by a river or channel and is protected by a chain of mountains in its southern rim. Tissot mentions the existence of a pond and four streams at the same distance from each other and of the same width, which would be, which have divided the sphere into four equal parts if prolonged from north from the North Pole southwards. Although he does not mention the giant black rock, the Rupes Nigra Altissima, um, drawn by Mercator in the center of the pond or lake to represent the Earth's magnetic pole, Tissot's verbal representation of the North Pole is strikingly similar to the visual representation provided by Mercator. Mercator was the first to present this quadripartite north in this geographical projection, in, and I mean, in the, the popularity of this image was such that in the early 17th century, numerous copies and smaller format editions were made of Mercator's projection in the United Provinces. The smaller sized versions of Matthias Quad, Petrus Versius, and Jodicus Hondius, and the ones made by Johannes Klappenburg were some of them. Interesting, interestingly enough, when Jodicus Hondius bought the plates of Mercator's, uh, in 1604, he modified one of the four islands to incorporate 
Barent's discovery of new land or Spitsberger Island, but he calls it new land, right? Uh, the question is, or one of the many questions is, was this perhaps one of the uh, versions that Tissot de Patot was acquainted to? As a teacher of uh, mathematics in a school in Deventer, which was Tissot's post, uh, he was probably interested and familiar with Mercator's map and the polar regions and its many versions and projections. But regardless of version that Tissot had seen, he is evidently, or he was evidently, not familiar with the ideas of the water flow proposed by Mercator. Mercator explained, and I'm going back to the, this one, just think of the uh, highlighted in blue. This is what Tissot says, but Mercator said that the waters of the oceans were carried northward to the pole through these rivers with great force. I mean, not what Tissot is saying, that they're flowing downwards, right? And that they would then disappear into an enormous whirlpool beneath the mountain at the North Pole. While for Mercator and other geographers, the water flowed inwards towards the pole, Tissot not only omits the presence of a magnetic mountain in the middle of the lake, but makes a water flow outwards. The water descended from it all around, says Tissot. Many questions remain around, unanswered, but it is possible to believe that having seen the deltas at the end of the rivers um, and not having read Mercator's notes, Tissot interpreted that the rivers were flowing outwards. This in turn sheds light on the circulation of geographic knowledge and cartographic images beyond scholarly context, which is the last part of this presentation and which is very brief. Uh, the analysis of Tissot's, uh, Tissot de Patot's boreal fiction has allowed us to observe the appropriations of a geographical imaginary of the North, Pole re North Polar region made by the son of a Huguenot refugee, this was the case of Tissot, in the United Provinces. Tissot held a modest teaching post in the Calvinist community of Deventer, but aspired to be an homme de lettres. He used part of the information contained in La Peyre's Relation de Groland to authenticate the adventures of Pierre de Messange, but he also resorted to the transposition of William Barron's and Gerardus Mercator's maps, or at least one of their many copies and imitations of these maps, to create a plausible scenario in which to develop his imaginary travel account. The hypertext, that is the utopian travel account, selected up-to-date geographical knowledge and through ekphrasis, referred the reader to an image of the North Pole that was familiar to him. Tissot de Patot's fictional travel account was thus anchored in a specific representation of the North Pole, that which had originated in the period of overseas expansion and prevailed until the early 18th century. If every act of transposition implies a partial transformation or slight alteration of the text or image that is transposed, then La Vie, Les Aventures et les Voyages de Groenland reveals the varied uses or the many uses and interpretations of geographical knowledge and its circulation outside scholarly contexts. Thank you very much. <laughs>